there's a chance that you've never heard of the F2H Banshee. And if you have, you may not know much about it. And that's not much of a surprise. It was a workhorse of an aircraft, as we'll discover. But the Banshee was also singly responsible for one of the largest ever shifts in American strategic policy. You see, there's a perhaps apocryphal story that sometime in 1949, a sadly nameless Navy fighter pilot allegedly snuck up on a flight of the Air Force's shiny and much-vaunted new B-36 Intercontinental bombers. He paused for a couple of minutes to take some snaps of himself alongside the massive aircraft. Then he moved smartly out from underneath the behemoth and, over an open channel, invited its captain to say cheese. At the time, this was a massive deal. The Secretary of Defense had recently forced the Navy to cancel its new United States-class supercarriers on the basis that the strategic nuclear mission was already handled by the Air Force. The Navy's argument was that intercontinental bombers were, by definition, vulnerable to fighters, as they had to be optimized for range and easy flying over performance and survivability. A carrier-launched nuclear bomber with 1,500-mile range could be faster and hit targets that the big sack bombers couldn't. Just to prove their point, they proposed that their bomber not even bother with landing gear, saving 5% weight. Cortez burning his ships when he reached the New World. That lone Banshee pilot demonstrated that although the Navy's design ideas were a bit mad, their point was a good one. The Secretary of Defense, Lewis A. Johnson, had specifically forbidden the Navy from doing a formal fly-off against the B-36. He probably knew that it might not go well, but the Navy apparently conducted their own informal demonstration, thus demonstrating that they should also be part of the nuclear equation. That realization would immediately lead to the Forrestal class of carriers, but also to the Savage, the Sky Warrior, Vigilante, and eventually to Polaris and Trident. But we're not here for those things. This is a video about the F-2H Banshee. Part of the problem in pinning down how good, bad, or indifferent the Banshee was is the vast number of iterations and improvements it went through. It represents perhaps the widest variety of physical changes made on a core aircraft design while retaining the same designation certainly within the period. Before I get into the details, let me show you what I mean. The initial production F2H1 Banshee was 39 feet long with a 41 foot 6 inch wingspan and it weighed 9,800 pounds empty. The H2 added another foot to the fuselage length and 3 feet to the wingspan. Because of the outstanding high altitude performance and great range the Banshee demonstrated, the Navy chose to modify it as a night and all-weather fighter. The interim 2N had a 25-inch nose extension to fit the radar, but the definitive F2H3 and 4 versions added fully 8 feet to the fuselage length, but reverted to a version of the original wings. Both the F3 and F4 are therefore substantially heavier and larger, weighing over 13,000 pounds empty. To round things out, there was also a recon modification of the Dash 2, featuring a 3-foot nose extension and deletion of the cannons. Because there are fundamental differences between the short fuselage day fighter banshees and the later supersized versions, in this video I'm going to cover the former. Part 2 will deal with the big guy. Photo banshees will be covered at a later date. Preamble out of the way, let's get into part one and see where it leads. The FH-1 Phantom was a modest success for the Navy and a massive moment for McDonnell. It could even be said to have defined the company. As a test bed, it demonstrated that a jet fighter could comfortably operate from a carrier. It also showed that McDonnell could build an effective combat aircraft but the Phantom was not really a viable fighter. For starters, it was not the fastest of aircraft, restricted to only about 500 miles an hour. Although it could supplement its 375 gallons of internal fuel with 295 gallons in a bulbous under-fuselage tank, its range was only 980 miles in ferry configuration, 
combat radius was more like 250 miles. The range-obsessed US Navy considered this nowhere near sufficient. Finally, the Phantom was lightly armed by late 1940s standards, packing only 450 caliber machine guns in the nose. A little over a month after the Phantom's successful first flight, the Navy therefore commissioned McDonnell to build a successor. That was March 2, 1945. The Navy also ordered first-generation fighters from North American Aviation and from Vought. These wouldn't turn out quite so well. Sensibly, McDonnell's initial idea was just to scale up the Phantom and fit a pair of Westinghouse J-34s, raising total power from £3,200 to £6,000. They quickly realised that this wasn't going to work and went back to the drawing board. So although it looks superficially the same, the Banshee is actually an almost completely clean sheet design that retains only the original concept of wing root engine placement from the Phantom. The fuselage is deeper, slightly longer and built more strongly. The wing is similar in shape but is 7 inches longer and rather finer in profile. The main gear retract outward rather than inward ahead of the steerable nose wheel. More obviously, the tail is significantly larger to improve directional stability. One curiosity of the Navy contract was that it specified the new fighter feature a kneeling front landing gear strut. This was also common to the North American Fury and Vought Pirate, and it was intended to enable larger jets to be packed with the nose of one under the tail of another to increase hangar utilisation. It also raised the jet exhaust, reducing the effect of operating the engines in the close confines of the deck or hangar when taxiing. To operate it, the deck crew placed a kneeling dolly under the nose, but this feature was rarely, if ever, used in practice, and it did not feature thereafter. The prototype XFH-1 took to the air on the 11th of January 1947. It was immediately apparent that McDonnell had crafted another winner. On its first flight, it demonstrated an ability to climb at 9,000 feet a minute, nearly double that of any other fighter in existence. Weighed down with weapons and avionics it would need in service, production aircraft wouldn't quite be this dynamic, but they were still impressive climbers. There were remarkably few issues in testing. Removing the tailplane dihedral and reducing the area of the dorsal spine resolved a minor control problem with the tailplane, but at a time when experimental fighters delighted in killing test pilots, the XFH-1 must have been a real breath of fresh air. In the spring of 1947, the Navy was sufficiently happy to order the first production batch. Because McDonnell liked to name their aircraft after spirits and phantasms, they named it the Banshee. Budget restrictions meant that 30 aircraft would be ordered in 1947 and 26 were deferred to 1948. McDonnell didn't care. After nearly a decade of trying, they finally had a contract for a frontline combat aircraft with significant development potential. The first production Banshees came off the lines in St. Louis, Missouri in August 1948. It was 39 feet long with a 41.5 foot wingspan, it weighed 9,764 pounds empty, 400 pounds more than Grumman's F9 F2 Panther. Its height was 14 feet and 5 inches. If you're a fan of fleet air arm aviation, that is a massive 5 feet higher than the Hawker Seahawk, which is the nearest match to the Banshee in that service. Maximum takeoff weight was a shade under 19,000 pounds. It was a big boy even in this form. Construction was stressed skin with plentiful access panels to simplify maintenance. The wings folded, as you'd expect, with folding being electrically driven. Control systems were conventional, with the exception of the aileron system, which incorporated hydraulic boost. That boost could be turned off from the cockpit in the event of a partial failure, or if the pilot didn't fancy it for some reason. The split flaps, speed brakes and trim tabs were all electrically actuated. Trim was adjusted using either a wheel on the top of the stick in early versions, or later a four-directional joystick. Pilot equipment was standard for advanced fighters in the day, 
and included an ejection seat and a pressurised air-conditioned cockpit. As it happens, while flying an F-2H-1, a VF-171 pilot made the first successful ejection by an American pilot in a genuine emergency when failing to recover from a spiral dive in adverse weather. The air conditioning system allowed the pilot to choose a temperature to suit his preferences. Very modern. Performance-wise, the Banshee had a 587 mile an hour top speed at sea level and a service ceiling of 48,500 feet. In practice, it would go up as high as 52,500, which was perfect for catching a sack bomber unawares. Nothing else in period had that kind of high altitude performance. The Phantom's machine guns were replaced by four 20mm M3 cannons with 150 rounds, now in the lower nose to prevent the pilot being blinded by the flash when firing at night. The cannon installation was well designed. Ammunition could be replenished in just six minutes through the access panels in the side of the nose. It retained the bubble canopy and excellent all-round visibility of the Phantom. To access the cockpit, the pilot first stepped on a foothold in the nose wheel door, then climbed via two additional steps fared into the fuselage. It's a nice bit of engineering. Most impressively though, internal fuel capacity went up to 877 gallons. At combat speed and weight, it therefore had a combat radius of 300 miles, including 20 minutes over the target. But throttled back and flying on one engine, it could cruise for nearly 2,000 miles, besting even piston-engined aircraft. Better still, it did all of this while remaining a lovely aircraft to bring aboard ship. The big wing and well-designed flaps gave it an approach speed of only 101 miles per hour, better than any of its peers and possibly lower than any conventional naval jet fighter to date. Only 56 F2H1s were built, initially with the 3,000 pound force JEWE 22 and then upgraded to the Dash 30 with 3,150 pounds each. They had short service lives as McDonnell were already working on the next version. As the first 56 aircraft were being built, McDonnell had developed a new design. This stretched the fuselage 14 inches forward of the wing to 40 feet and 2 inches, enabling an additional 177 gallons of fuel to be carried in three self-sealing fuselage fuel tanks. The small 44-gallon tank in the centre section stub wings remained. 200-gallon tip tanks were also fitted, necessitating strengthened wings but also increasing range still further. Combat radius was now 575 miles, although with more weight, maximum speed was down to 575 miles per hour and theoretical service ceiling fell by a couple of thousand feet. Cruising at 35,000 feet, the Banshee had five hours of endurance. Unlike in the contemporary Panther, the tanks could be dropped in flight, a fact that led to a severe shortage of them in Korea. Typical takeoff weight from a carrier with a full fuel load was about £16,000. An added benefit of the stronger wing was the ability to carry either bombs or rockets on four pylons under each wing. Options listed in the flight manual are eight £100 bombs, four £250 bombs, two £500ers, or up to eight 5-inch rockets. Alternatively, it could carry a pair of massive 11 and 3 quarter inch Tiny Tim rockets. The Navy loved it. They ordered 179 in August 1948 and another 279 in 1949. 406 would ultimately be built, making it the most numerous Banshee variant. There was also an F2H2B with even stronger wings. This could carry up to 3,000 pounds of stores under each of them. In turn, this enabled the 27 aircraft of this version to carry a 1,650-pound Mark 7, or if overloaded, a 3,250-pound Mark 8 nuclear bomb. In the main, they were either used in small detachments on carriers or for testing. The bomb was always carried on the inner left wing pylon. The Mark 8 in particular is comically large on the small Banshee. To get it to clear the deck meant extending the landing shocks to their maximum height. 
Now, nose gear strut extension was a standard feature of the Banshee to get the nose attitude right for catapult launch, but the Dash 2B modification meant adding two separate hydraulic fluid tanks. The fluid in both tanks was added to both main gear shock struts to extend them fully for takeoff and taxiing. The struts only partially deflated automatically when the landing gear was retracted so that the aircraft could be landed with the stores still aboard. I can't imagine that this would have been possible on a carrier though because the landing gear compression required to bring a heavy fighter aboard would have precluded it. To remove the remainder of the extra fluid from the struts and therefore restore normal strut action, the pilot had to actuate a switch on the left console after he had lowered the landing gear. That strut extension capability was not applied from the factory. It was a kit that could be added on the ship, suggesting that it was only occasionally used in practice. To extend range, the Dash 2Bs were later fitted with a removable refueling probe in place of the starboard upper 20mm cannon. Plumbing ran under the fuselage and into the main fuel tank. In one memorable exercise, three Dash 2B Banshees armed with dummy Mark 7 nuclear shapes flew from USS Midway, 100 miles off Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, refueled from savages when airborne, dropped to treetop level over Florida, and flew undetected, even though the Air Force had been alerted, to a target in Lake Erie. On the return, F-86s and F-89 Scorpions tried to intercept them, but were baited down to 5,000 feet, when the Banshees then zoomed to 55,000 feet, leaving the Air Force interceptors spinning out as they tried to follow them up to high altitude. The Banshees refueled over the Atlantic and landed on the Midway after a nearly eight-hour flight, a record 2,800 nautical mile mission. Although straight-winged and equipped with relatively simple avionics, the fundamentally excellent aerodynamics of the Banshee gave carrier air groups a new set of capabilities and the enemy a new tactical problem to solve. Although the Navy was crying out for more and better jet fighters to fight in Korea, it was over a year before any Banshees entered the theatre. The simple reason for this was that although Korea was a brutal conflict that caused the death of millions, it was still essentially a sideshow to the Cold War in Europe, which was rapidly heating up. For this reason, Atlantic and Mediterranean squadrons had priority for the Banshee, which was regarded as superior to the Panther. For this reason, the Banshee barely featured in the war. Essex brought the Blue Bolts and their Banshees into action in August 1951. She arrived in the middle of Operation Strangle as US Air Forces were attempting to prevent communist supplies and reinforcements from reaching the Korean battlefield by cutting a one-degree latitudinal belt across Korea to sever major highways along which the bulk of enemy troops and material was being transported. The Banshee was particularly suited for rail interdiction. Easy to maintain, ruggedly built and very resistant to flak damage, the F-2H2 with its twin jets had a high rate of climb that permitted multiple attacks on a target. Post-war analysis indicated that 35% of all of the bombs dropped by the Blue Bolts had actually managed to cut a rail line. Banshees were generally employed on these fast armed reconnaissance and interdiction missions with close air support and attacks on hard targets left to Corsairs and Sky Raiders. In fairness, Panthers were used in relatively similar circumstances and with relatively similar intent. That said, the plane's 30 minute endurance advantage over the Panther impressed pilots from a flight safety standpoint. Although interestingly enough, some Panther pilots had a dim view of the J-34's reliability, and some even declined to fly it in the reserves after they had been demobbed post-war. The Neen and its reliability was a real draw. That said, the Banshee's J-34s proved that they could absorb battle damage and return to base. In several cases, engines continued working perfectly when riddled with holes from flak. In one particular incident, because of its range and high altitude performance, it was better able than the F-86 Sabre to provide top cover for a B-29 raid of 35 aircraft going in to hit a supply and railroad terminal at Rashin near the Soviet border. 
A dozen banshees from the Blue Bolts provided the escort, but no MiGs turned up and the banshee remained untested. All of the super fortresses returned to base unharmed. Once Essex departed, it was a year until Kearsarge, beloved of this channel, brought VF-11 Red Rippers into the theatre. Once Kearsarge itself left, Lake Champlain deployed two squadrons, VF-22 Cavaliers and VF-62 Boomerangs, the only time that two Banshee squadrons were simultaneously active in the theatre. It was actually the photo Banshees that were most active in the war. Eight carriers operated detachments of them, but as I said, that's a story for another day. Now there are some people who like to get clicks by suggesting that the Banshee was somehow too slow to fight the MiG-15 in Korea. This is, in my view at least, rubbish. The historical record shows that the Banshee was needed in Europe precisely because it was regarded as more survivable than the Panther. If MiG-15s had attacked, then the Banshees were just as capable of defending themselves as Panthers were. For starters, its larger wing area gave it lower wing loading than the Korean-era Panthers, and it had basically the same thrust-to-weight ratio in a combat configuration. Since the Panther achieved a genuine 3-to-1 kill-to-loss ratio over the Faggot, I can't imagine that Banshee pilots would have been anything other than sensibly cautious if they'd encountered MiGs. As it happens, on the occasions that MiGs and Banshees shared the same piece of sky, it was the latter that fled the scene while the Navy aviators on cap tried to coax them into a fight. More prosaically, the day-to-day -day experience of handling the Banshee in Korea was a mixed bag. On one hand, the Banshee was generally easy to maintain. A good crew could change an engine, tune it and test it in less than two hours. The installation part of this could apparently be accomplished in 20 minutes. On the downside, the fuel tanks proved to be a pain. The Banshee's wings could not be folded if the tanks were full, so if an aircraft needed to be pulled off from the launch or otherwise retasked, then it took some time. Essex encountered some issues with the fuselage supports of the catapult hook, which led to its Banshees being used only for combat air patrol in the latter part of its crews. These issues were seemingly resolved by the time Kearsarge arrived, as it didn't report similar issues. Although the Banshee had a 45-foot wingspan, it was still relatively easy to handle around the deck. With two reliable engines, it also launched well, and no aircraft were lost to cold shots in the theatre. Lake Champlain did lose one Banshee and its pilot when the securing pin on the port tip tank failed. The tip came off halfway down the deck, causing the Banshee to rotate and hit the water upside down. Sadly, the pilot drowned in his cockpit. As the war went on, the Kearsarge's crew improvised a number of fixes to issues like unloading the tip tanks. In that case, they fabricated handling stands to aid tank removal. Availability of start carts remained an issue throughout the cruise, though. Because it had two engines, the Banshee put heavy load on this scarce resource aboard ship. When judged in totality, the after-action report said that the Banshee was a more effective aircraft than the F9F5 Panther. It was faster, climbed better when loaded, and had greater range and loiter time. The Panther's only area of superiority was that it could catapult launch with 2,000 pounds of stores rather than just 1,200 on the Banshee. That's not to take anything away from the Panther, though. It was a good aircraft that flew many times more sorties than the McDonnell fighter over the course of the war. And, of course, it had development potential. With swept wings, it became the Cougar and served for another six or eight years. As it was, the speed of modern air combat was increasing. New jet bombers like the Bison and the turboprop Bear were entering Soviet service. These could strike faster and from higher altitude, requiring faster defenders. In the strike role, ability to carry special stores was increasingly important. Larger, faster and swept or delta-winged aircraft equipped with advanced avionics were the order of the day. The short fuselage Banshee Day fighters were rapidly phased out as a wave of new aircraft entered service. Typically their squadrons moved on to the Fury, Cougar or Skyray. Some were stood down altogether. Banshees did find some short-term employment on the Navy's new anti-submarine carrier conversions from Essex-class fleet carriers. 
The idea in this case was to provide an ability for an anti-submarine task force to operate in waters contested by enemy bombers. The last of these deployments was by VF-172 on the Tarawa in 1957. Sidewinder armed Skyhawks eventually took over the mission. Some Banshees remained with reserve squadrons until 1962, by which point a fighter that had once been at the cutting edge was thoroughly obsolete. But as the original Banshees were leaving the frontline fleet, the Big Banjo story was just beginning. In my mind, the Banshee is a thoroughly underappreciated combat aircraft. It launched McDonnell into the big time, ultimately resulting in the Phantom II. It also has a good case for being the most tactically effective straight-wing jet fighter. In this period, range, reliability and availability were arguably more useful than an extra 50 miles an hour of clean speed. A debate for another day, perhaps. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, then please consider subscribing. It really helps the channel. And of course, there's a big banjo video coming soon.